Good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Ishan, for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to talk to you this evening. And um, I would also would like to thank you all for um, uh, logging on at the end of a hard working day and listening to of all the topics, anatomy and physiology. I'll try my best to make it as interesting as possible. So like Ishan says, I work in uh, sunny Lanarkshire. Um, it's an area just um, outside Glasgow. In fact, this is the only area now which is not under lockdown. And this is my hospital, the University Hospital of Monklands. We have a, a huge population of ex-industrial uh, population with lots of ear disease. And they usually come to me when the disease is very extensive. But on the flip side, we got a lot of beautiful scenery. And you know, as you can see, and if you are interested in photography or travel or nature walks, it's an absolutely fantastic area for that. I also run the endoscopic ear surgery course, usually in the first week of October, as you can see. But unfortunately, this year has been canceled because of the lockdown. And they, I'm not sure whether uh, people are able to attend. And uh, this is Professor Marchioni and uh, uh, Mr. Lobo admiring the state of the art equipment. In fact, these are the original equipment used by William McKeven, who was the eminent um, neurosurgeon and autologist who sort of described the McEwen's triangle. So when you say anatomy, we, we start from the ear canal, obviously, and this is how we do it. So this is a, a three millimeter. Um, mm, the video is not playing. So let me just, I'm not sure why that is. Ishan, can you? No. Um... Okay, so I think we will have to just, um, what we'll have to do is, um, I'm not sure why it is not playing. So I can go to the next slide and you know, that is more interesting. So, okay. Let's see whether this video plays, okay? So. That's fine. So you can see we've used a three millimeter endoscope. And what we can see is that as soon as you open, this is the lateral incudomalleolar ligament here. And you can see the facial nerve. We haven't even removed any bone. And you can see the pyramid over there. And that is the posterior crura. And that is the pondiculus. And you can see the round window niche area here. And this area here is the subiculum. And what we are seeing is the, uh, the sinus tympani. You can see in the pondiculus, in this case is like a bridge pondiculus. There is a space underneath so that if you have cholesterol there, it can come here or either in this direction. But if you look carefully, the round window is not a very small round window at all. You know, it's a huge complex. And this here is the inferior most limit of the retro tympanum called funiculus. And you can see what we are pointing out now is the area called the subcochlear canaliculus. And this is the posterior ligament of the malleus. So all these structures you're able to see without actually removing any bone. So what is the importance of all the structures? That is a question. So this is a diagrammatic representation. I've taken it from Professor Marchioni's book, which uh, is a wonderful book and all these illustrations are drawn by him. So this is the area of uh, retro tympanum that we are talking about. You can see the facial nerve over there and that's the sinus tympani here. And the way to identify the pondiculus is you look at the promontory and on top of the promontory, there will be a small amount of bone going towards the area of the pyramid. And that becomes the, uh, the pondiculus. And, the soup, and if you follow the lip of the roof of the round window niche, 
the posterior most part may continue backwards and that becomes subiculum. And in between pondiculus and subiculum is sinus tympani. Below the sinus tympani is a sub sinus recess. And uh, that is uh, actually, it can be continuous with the sinus tympani if the subiculum is a type of a bridge subiculum, for example. And inferiorly, you can see the funiculus. And this is the retro tympanum in, in its uh, full glory. The main point that I want to make is the sinus tympani in the previous uh, example was a very shallow one. Sinus tympani can be divided into A, B, and C. Type A is when it is actually not going beyond the level of the facial nerve. And in here, it is going sort of, you know, up to the middle of the facial nerve. And type C is very deep. It is going beyond the level of the facial nerve. And uh, the implications of this is that if you have disease going into the sinus tympani, it can be very difficult to see. And it will be almost impossible to see with the microscope because the facial nerve is there. And even with the endoscope, you may have to do special techniques. So the next video, I hope that it will play. So I'm just going to show you some practical techniques of how you can sort of um, see. This is a child, 10 year old child with a second look operation. Previously there was a cholesterol in the sinus tympani. So you can see there is a bit of retraction here and uh, the tympanic membrane itself is retracted. So I'm going to fast forward this for a few minutes. So, so we're just raising the tympanometal flap and you can see there's a small amount of cholestatoma, like a pearl. So I was very happy that there was nothing there in the sinus tympani, but this is the stapes, which is a little bit flattened. And this is the area of the sinus tympani. And I'm using a zero degree scope, okay? So you can see that initially I thought that that's all clear and there's nothing there and small amount of cholestatoma is gone. But on clearing, what you can see is that unfortunately there is recurrence of cholesterol there. And uh, there is cholesterol here. But even with the, this is a type B uh, sinus tympani. I'm not able to see very well. So I've used the 45 degree scope standing on the same side. Okay, this is a technique that we normally do. You can see the view changes and you can see a bit more better. But 45 degree scope is a very, tricky to use because the angle of the view is towards the, you and then when you're introducing the scope you're not going to uh, see what you expect to see and you will touch the anterior wall so even with that i'm not able to see so another technique that i've developed with the help of uh, professor marchioni is that what you do is you go and stand on the other side of the patient and then use the scope in such a way that you are actually looking forwards can you imagine that? The only problem is the nurses will be angry with you because they will have to change everything and you will have to have a monitor on the opposite side as well. So we have freestanding monitors which we can connect. So when you see end on view of the sinus tympani, it's very different. So let me show you. So can you see this is the facial nerve now and I'm going to see directly into the sinus tympani. And uh, you can see there is quite a lot of cholesterol there and it's slowly being removed. It's a wonderful view with the 45 degree scope standing on the other side, but it takes a lot of practice and uh, it can be dangerous if you're not sure where, where you are. And this is a facial nerve here and that is a sinus tympani. And we are still struggling to remove the cholesterol and I'll show you the the facial nerve area here and your medial to the facial nerve here. So it's an end on view. You are looking and I'm using a very small sort of curet. And this is shaped in such a way that uh, it, it has got angulation, which will help you to go into the sinus tympani. And that's a good view of the sinus tympani. Still there is disease and I'm still trying to remove it. And that is a technique that you can use. But first of all, this is the facial nerve here. 
and that is the oval window with the the stay piece there and that is the relationship you can we see very clearly and this is the sinus tympani so moving on atichotomy endoscopic atichotomy can be interesting because even if you remove a little bit of bone you are going to see quite a lot of structures so i am going to see whether this video plays okay can you see the video now yes we can that's brilliant thank you so sorry about this so you can see that i have removed a little bit of bone and you can see the top of the ossicles there and this is a view of the this is the incudostapial joint can you see the um, the tensor tympani muscle there and uh, the processes and this is the processes and uh, this is the tensor tympani tendon which you would have never seen like this otherwise and the facial uh, nerve is down there and i'm just removing the incus so that i can show you the attic anatomy a bit more better i have increased the speed of the video but unfortunately it's not um i'm not sure why but anyway so there is the attic and this area here can you see this bony structure coming from the roof attaching coming on to the uh, processes that is the cog this is the cog and anterior to the cog is the area called tensor fold and the tensor fold is open in this case and now we are just able to see it is going to cut the attachments and this is the tensor fold here and it's an open tensor fold that is the tensor tympani tendon and the processes with the cog and anterior to the cog if the tensor fold is vertical there is a large area called supratubular recess and that is just above the eustachian tube can you see this is the supratubular recess and this is the cog and that is the facial nerve and this here in the top will be the tegmen and you can see the tendon and uh, look at the anatomy of the facial nerve it is always just above the level of the processus cochlearyformis and uh, i know we are taking the stay piece off because you know at some part of the dissection we'll take this off and show the inside of the uh, inner ear so i hope that that is clear and uh, this is the schematic representation of what we have just seen so you can see that that is a process of cochlear reformis is there and that's a cog that's a facial nerve over here supratubular recess here and that is the eustachian tube and it's another closer view of the same thing and uh, including the retrotympanum and you can see the area of the carotid artery here as well so once you've removed the ossicles i also want to show you the exact anatomy of the facial nerve so that is the next step and we just cutting the uh, corda tympani off so that we can i can show you what is beyond that i'm sorry the video is a little bit slow but it will get there okay so you can see the facial nerve and then it's uh, going this way and that is the geniculate ganglion area and uh, can you see what we are going to do is uh, the relationship of the oval window is very clear here and that is the process of cochlear reformis what we are going to now do is expose the tendon of the uh, tensor tympani and also show you the area in the supratubular recess here can you see a bit of thin uh, bone that is actually the tegmen and above that is the dura i'll just forward this video a little bit so that i am um, okay so we're just uh, opening up the the bone on the tensor tympani muscle itself you can see this is the body of the muscle of the tensor tympani and that is a tendon and uh, if you fast forward that a little bit more you can see that that's a muscle and uh, 
this thin layer of bone. Don't try this at home, okay? This is mainly to teach anatomy and uh, I almost never had to do it on a real patient. But if you have cholesteatoma here, uh, if you know the anatomy, what happens is uh, your sort of dissection and your courage will be much better to remove the disease. So I, I fast forward this a little bit more and you can see this is the, I'm just, we are just removing the tensor tympani muscle itself forward, very gently using a small sort of curette. And um, you can see the relationship between the tensor tympani muscle and the facial nerve here. Okay, so there, we just moved the muscle forward. Can you see the, this is the, the nerve, it is going medially, and that is the geniculate ganglion area there. And uh, if you for, trace the geniculate ganglion forwards there, you will see the greater petrosal nerve. So that is the anatomy of the facial nerve. So how does it work when you're doing surgery, okay? So this is the case where there's an atic cholesteatoma with a normal looking tympanic membrane. And uh, I'm going to show you what happens. These videos are okay because I didn't edit them yesterday. Only the ones edited yesterday is creating problem. You can see, this is the facial nerve here. And uh, this is the eustachian tube over there. And this is the area that we are talking about. And that is the, if you know that there is facial nerve is not going to be there, we can remove the disease or mucosa very easily. And this is eroded stay piece just there and this is the facial nerve it's completely eroded and uh, it's lying there without any bony covering but i'm able to do it because of the knowledge of anatomy will help you to do these dissections and uh, examinations much more sort of you know boldly and um, that is the area anteriorly this is where it is going to go medially. You can see it's completely lying denuded. The other thing I want to talk to you about is the round window region itself, okay? It's not a round area, as you can see. It's got sub areas where, um, you know, the round window itself can be divided into the round window complex plus the, the subcochlear canaliculus. So you can see this is subiculum and the round window is going to be here. And this is the subcochlear canaliculus. And this has been um, explicitly studied by Professor Marchioni and his team. And you can see sometimes cholesteatoma there into the, uh, the subcochlear canaliculus. So if you look at a CT scan, this is a CT scan, a coronal view of a CT scan. And this is what we are talking about in a very pneumatized ear. And underneath the cochlea, subcochlear canaliculus can extend all the way into the Petrus FX, as you can see. So how does it affect you in your practice? This is the video that I'm going to show um, a post superior retraction pocket and cholesteatoma in a patient. And um, you will see the uh, cholesteatoma going into the subcochlear canaliculus. So you can see there's quite a lot of disease. This is anterior epitympanum, it's clear. And the disease is all around the stay piece and uh, in the area of the uh, sinus tympani. So you can see this is the subcochlear canaliculus and there is disease there. So I'm removing the disease using a very fine curette. You can see the subcochlear canaliculus is clear, but there is still cholesteatoma. I want to show you the relationship between subcochlear canaliculus, sinus tympani and round window. So cholesteatoma is being removed from around the stay piece. And now there's more, and that is the area of the round window. And when you irrigate, the round window becomes clear and it is all covered in cholesteatoma. So this is the round window area and that is a subcochlear canaliculus in real life. But subcochlear canaliculus is a dangerous structure, okay? Don't think that you can go in with the drill because anteriorly, the anterior border of the subcochlear canaliculus can be the uh, carotid artery and posterior boundary can be the jugular bulb. 
So this is a case where I did a microscopic operation. This is probably the worst case I've ever done in my life, where cholestatum is going from external artery canal to the sphenoid sinus. So I'll show you the subcochlear canaliculus in real life in a very extensive way. So this is the start of the dissection. And you can see a lot of cholestatoma, but I'm going to forward this video to, I'm just opening up the, this is the facial recess, sorry, the facial ridge being opened up. And you can see there's a lot of disease there. So the action starts. And this is the area underneath the middle ear. There is still a lot of cholestatoma there as well. So if we go forward there, I'm just lowering the facial ridge. Okay, now can you see the whole of the area is eroded. This is actually the carotid artery here. And posteriorly is the sigmoid sinus. And this is the disease going through the subcochlear canaliculus all the way into the petrous apex and in the sphenoid sinus. So I'm just drilling using a diamond drill, as you can see, just at the promontory so that I can get at the cholestatoma and remove this as much as possible. This patient already had meningitis and CSF leak when I was uh, doing this operation and I had to do this to save his life. So you can see uh, the extended anatomy, carotid artery there and the si sigmoid sinus will be here. And this is what you see if you do an extended approach through the uh, subcochlear canaliculus. So now we move on to the area of hypotympanum. Okay, what is hypotympanum? We hardly ever notice hypotympanum. It is a part of the tympanic cavity that lies below the level of the eardrum. So you don't see it. And uh, the boundary is funiculus. And this is the funiculus uh, posteriorly. And uh, the hypotympanum goes all the way anteriorly this way into the another bit of bone called proteniculus. And this has got irregular bony sort of uh, spicules and uh, trabeculae and it can vary in depth between one and five millimeters. So the hypotympanum, the problem is that inferiorly is the jugular bulb. And in 25% of the cases, jugular bulb protrudes into the tympanic cavity in varying degree. So you can see the jugular bulb is not at all visible, but it's more visible here. And this jugular bulb is very much protruding into the ear canal. So, and the bone may be dehiscent as well. And uh, the other problem is hypotympanum. In about a quarter of the patients, sometimes the anterior wall is dehiscent and it is owned by the uh, thin bony lining of the carotid artery. So I'll show you a case where I ran into trouble. And so this is just to catch up. You can see this is the area of the retrotympanum here. And that's the funiculus. From funiculus to proteniculum, which is this bone here, is the hypotympanum, okay? Nothing major is there apart from jugular bulb. But when it starts bleeding, you're not going to laugh. So this is a case where I learned a lesson. So the case in with a nice retraction pocket, okay? And I am just uh, elevating the cholestatoma here. And it's all it's hungry dory and looks fine. But what I didn't notice is completely exposed jugular bulb. So in this case, I, had a, I have a longer video. I raised the flap and then it started bleeding like mad. And uh, then only I realized that actually I've gone and opened up the jugular bulb a little bit. But don't panic if this happens, all that you have to do is put the flap back, put some adrenaline and um, adrenaline soap patties. The other thing to do is lower the head end because you don't want an air embolism if it is a large hole going into the sigmoid sinus. This will be a question that is usually asked in the exit exam. And you know they want to know how you react. And uh, so this is how you do it. And then in this case, I was able to stop the bleeding and continue and uh, finish the operation all endoscopically. So now the last bit of the anatomy is the jigsaw, uh, is uh, the protympanum, okay? What is protympanum? Protympanum is nothing but another name for the area anterior to the, uh, the Jacobson's nerve on the promontory and all the way into the eustachian tube. And uh, it involves the bony eustachian tube as well. So it's already, you know, all, always previously known as bony portion of the eustachian tube. And uh, 
This is the diagrammatic representation of the protympanum. The protympanum can have a quadrangular sort of, you know, appearance, like in this case, or a triangular one, okay? And the main thing to remember is that this is a view from the back, and this is the superior, and that's inferior. Tensor tympanic muscle is there, and posteriorly, um, anteriorly, you can see the carotid artery there, and uh, inferiorly, the proteniculum. And this is another sort of appearance or diagrammatic representation of the protympanum. So tensor tympanic muscle here, protympanum, and carotid artery is always on its anterior wall uh, the, in varying depths. These are pictures from my own operation, okay? So you can see there are two pictures of the same patient, and this one is, I'm further into the bony eustachian tube. This is the proteniculum that I was talking about, and that's a bit of bone, which actually is the inferior most limit of the uh, protympanum, and superiorly, this is the canal for tensor tympani. And uh, in this patient, the uh, tensor fold had a very sort of higher attachment leaving a very large area of the supratable recess. And this is the bony eustachian tube and uh, protympanum with the proteniculum. And when you withdraw the scope, you get a panoramic view and you can appreciate how the anatomy looks. And again, the protympanum itself uh, can be seen with various uh, diagrammatic representation here, tensor tympani muscle, subtensor recess, which is an area underneath the tensor tympani, and this is a proteniculum and uh, the carotid artery is here. The proteniculum itself, the importance of this is structure is that if you, if you don't have it, sometimes the carotid artery may be very much superficial to you than uh, you imagine. And uh, the problem is with endoscope, you tend to go for further in, and you, know, you need to be careful when you put your sharp instrumentation into the eustachian tube. In 58% of the cases, it was a ridge sort of shaped structure and uh, so that was okay but in a quarter of the patients it was a bridge so there's a space underneath the proteniculum and in 20 percent of cases it is absent so as you can see the carotid artery then is going to be very much uh, under a thin lining of bone the subtensor recess uh, again this is an area just underneath the tensor tympani and uh, depending upon how deep it is, it has been divided into type A, B, and C. If it is non-existent, it's absent, 35% is type A. Shallow, just going up to the middle of the tensor tympani is B, and very deep is C. And uh, the importance of this is that if you have cholesteatoma there, uh, it can be hiding in the subtensor recess. So what is the importance of uh, the protympanum and the endoscopic anatomy itself? You have to understand that the anatomy, a uh, lot of structures, what we thought were just uh, fibrous tissues, actually ligaments, and they hold the uh, ossicles, and they also control the pathway of ventilation. Cholesteatum and the protein venom can be a problem, and uh, uh, unknown to you, the carotid artery may be dehiscent as well. And the surgical access to eustachian tubal area is through the protein venom, and sometimes you, you might see cerebrospinal leak and uh, uh, Ortic neurology, for example, can be treated with um, the um, division of the Jacobson's nerve. This is the uh, importance of the microanatomy and, and the, or the endoscopic uh, detailed anatomy, shall I say. And that will help you to perform surgery, which is going to be minimally invasive and also uh, much more sort of targeted at your pathology. So I know that too much of anatomy can be mind boggling. And you know, many of you might feel like doing some meditation now. And uh, as I saw when I met this guy in Varanasi recently. So that's a bit about the endoscopic um, anatomy. And I think we will reserve the questions to the end, Ishan. And I'll just go to the applied physiology, if that is OK. Sounds great. Okay, guys, physiology of middle ear ventilation. Why physiology? Um, the 
thing is that endoscopic surgeries, um, according to some of my colleagues, is not only just a way of performing surgery with an endoscope, but it's a philosophy of, um, you know, it, not damaging things and also following the disease and also retaining the anatomical structures. So they thought that is a, almost like a functional surgery. And that's what uh, these guys call it as. They did not produce an acronym because if they did produce an acronym, we would have been, at least some of the surgeons would have been happy because it will be FES as opposed to FES. So why functional surgery? That's the question. If you look at these two cases, the eustachian tube is there and the aeration is into the middle ear, isn't it? So why there is an isolated cholesteatoma? Most of the adult cases, um, they are supposed to get isolated attic cholesteatoma as opposed to children who can get the posterior superior retraction pocket. And you can see the rest of the middle ear, it's not too bad. There are some air bubbles and fluid, but it's not too bad. And the, why is that it is happening like this? That's a question. So the physiology of uh, aeration is not a straightforward one. You've got eustachian tube, which opens very occasionally when you're speaking or yawning. And uh, it also depends upon the middle ear pressure homeostasis, which is a mechanism brought on by mastoid buffer as well as transmucosal gas exchange. And on top of that, we got middle ear ventilations uh, which can be blocked by congenital folds or acquired folds, and uh, the bony limits of the epitimperum also matters. So I'll tell you a very little bit about embryology. Okay, I know it's very complicated and uh, very sort of you know difficult to understand. The middle ear actually forms by uh, the ventilation pathways formed by three, four sacs. Okay, they have been named as sacus anterior, medial superior and posterior, okay? You don't have to know all of it, but there are two important things. The lateral inguromalleolar fold, which I showed earlier on, they form a boundary of the lateral aspect of the attic, okay? They form by the contact between the sacus superior, which is uh, there, and sacus medius. And so when they meet, they form the, the lateral inguromalleolar joint or ligament. The, the other important thing is the tensor fold because the tensor fold in most of these cases forms a key to the aeration of the anterior epitimbanum. And that is formed between the contact between the sacus andicus and sacus medius. Okay, sacus andicus is this structure, uh, the, the diagrammatic representation is here, that is the anterior aspect, eustachian tube, sacus andicus, and medius. We are looking from medial aspect, and when they meet, they form this mucosal fold called tensor fold. And uh, that is important. The other factors contributing to ventilation is the mastoid buffer itself. I'll take you to the, your uh, pre sort of medical sort of era where you must have learned Boyle's law. This is a law which states that uh, at a constant temperature, in this case, the body temperature of 37 degrees, the, the ratio the, or the, the pressure and uh, where the volume, they, they are in a constant sort of relationship. So that uh, if there is increase in volume, the pressure is going to be low and vice versa. So that translates as large mastoid, uh, it produces less fluctuations in the pressure. And you, you might have noticed that there is sclerotic mastoid is seen in most of the chronic otitis medias. But if, what it doesn't explain is that, why is that then there is a, Mastoid cavity obliterations doesn't produce any problems. We don't know. And uh, this shows the transmucosal gas exchange where oxygen and nitrogen and carbon dioxide goes from vascular space into the middle ear cavity. So not all the gases in the middle ear is produced by the eustachian tube. The anatomically, there is an area called epitympanic diaphragm and it's not described by any of the modern surgeons, uh, whereas these guys described in 1946. And this is a coronal uh, axial view at the level of the attic. Can you see that this is the uh, anterior inguromalleolar ligament, and this is the tensor fold, and that is the anterior malleolar ligament. So if you have a eustachian tube there, the ventilation can go into the middle ear, but in order for the gas to go into the attic 
and through that into the andrum is there's only two channels they are called isthmus this is the anterior isthmus between the incus and the malleus and the posterior isthmus is between posterior to the incus so this is the two areas of channels of aeration and the tensor fold it also holds a key to this if you have an intact tensor fold then that means aeration cannot go through that tensor fold can have two configurations this is a almost a vertical configuration and uh, this is a horizontal configuration along the tensor tendinae so there is no supratebral recess and a large sort of anterior epitimbus but if you have a vertical tensor tendinae as uh, a vertical tensor fold you don't have that much of an anterior epitimbus and uh, if you have a incomplete tensor fold then the aeration is going to be easier because the eustachian tube and you can go aeration directly into the attic so i got two examples of tensor fold here from my surgery this is a, a tensor fold which is on the left side you can see the attic area is here you can see the tensor fold anterior to the head of the malleus and uh, even without removing so i'm just removing the cholesteatoma and the ossicles and this video was taken when i was beginning to do endoscopic surgery as you can see a lot of blood and that's the intact tensor fold and just opening it up so this is slightly more horizontally placed tensor fold okay and uh, with the more of the space here but this example this is a, a another ear where there is attic cholesteatoma and uh, it's a right ear you can see the cholesteatoma and retraction there so i am just taking the um, eroded um, incus out of the equation and you can see the malleus head being taken off as well can you see the cholesteatoma is anterior to the head of the malleus and it is not visible so i'm just moving the cholesteatoma very gently using a fish raspatory and the vertical the tensor fold is intact here and you can see it's got a, almost a vertical configuration of the tensor fold and i'm just opening it up so that uh, it is attached to the cog and so the anterior epitimbarum is not that big but there must be a big supratebral area so the ventilation pathways this is again a diagrammatic representation malleus here cog here and incus so the isthmus is actually uh, you know you can see the the processes cochlear reform is here as well and tensor fold is here so isthmus anterior and that is the posterior isthmus and uh, you can see the incudostapedial joint and the stapes here and uh, this is a diagrammatic representation of how the ventilation is going to be going from the eustachian tube in between the isthmus into the andron so what happens in a normal ventilation is easy you even if you have intact tensor fold this is eustachian tube aeration will happen and that goes into the middle ear and through the isthmus into the attic and into the andron no problem but what happens if you have an intact tensor fold as you can see here and you have some sort of blockage of the isthmus with the edematous tissue as you can see the anterior and posterior isthmus is completely blocked with intact tensor fold and these are the cases where you get probably a attic retraction pocket in cholesteatoma danieli published his paper uh, in laryngoscope they looked at 102 cases of attic cholesteatoma 98 of them had uh, intact tensor fold as opposed to controls where only three of them had uh, intact tensor fold so he thinks that this is a probably a selective disventilation but i would say we are not sure we don't know whether what is what came first chicken or egg so whether the blockage caused the uh, the this uh, areas to be blocked off or whether this caused the attic cholesteatoma we don't know so i'll show you a picture of a operation where i saw a blocked isthmus in one of the patients so you'll we'll understand how this works in real life an isolated attic cholesteatoma here and then when you open up the middle ear you can see middle ear is good but there is this is the incudostapedial joint and i'm just moving the can you see the anterior isthmus is blocked and this is the incus and that's the malleus it's completely blocked 
And this is the coda here. That's the blockage of anteriorness. And I'm just trying to open that up, proving to be a bit difficult task. And then we decided to look at the posteriorness there. Even the posteriorness is completely blocked. So that is how it works in a real operation. And this is another picture of a, a case where this is the attic retraction pocket in cholesteatoma. You can see the isthmus is blocked, uh, and this is just a picture. So on top of the natural folds, you can even get acquired folds, as you can see. So if the tensor fold is there, sometimes, like the case I did last week, um, there's a complete fold separating the middle ear from the attic. And even if the tensor fold is open, there can be inflammatory sort of vertical folds or some other type of uh, fibrosis, which can block your ventilation. So in conclusion, I would say the middle ear ventilation is very complicated uh, uh, physiologically. If you have a large mastoid buffer, it is supposed to be good so that the fluctuations don't happen, uh, but it doesn't, it fails to explain how a cavity obliteration works. The middle ear mucosal folds, they play an important part. And intact tensor fold is found in many cases of attic cholesteatomas. Blockage of isthmus with edematous tissue has to be addressed. And uh, if you are not going to, if you have an intact ossicular chain, you need to take your time and uh, make sure that you are removing the edematous tissue so that the ventilation can be reestablished. The medialization of the handle of the malleus can be a problem as well. In such cases, I lift the eardrum off the handle of the malleus and uh, then examine the anterior part. And then you can put a graft on top of the handle of the malleus. So endoscopic surgery helps to examine the anatomy in detail and you can do more of a physiological surgery. I know too much of physiology can throw you off and uh, it can be a nightmare as this is a uh, actually a caricature I saw from the University of Glasgow uh, 100 years ago, uh, 1917, where the prominent anatomy professor Peyton has a nightmare that a frog is actually performing experiments on him rather than him performing the experiments on frog. I don't know about you guys, but when I was a medical student in India, unfortunately, a lot of frogs lost their life in the name of physiology. So hope you're not going to lose your sleep based on your physiology and you'll have a quiet night. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the great talk, Mr. Ayer. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the first one that was asked is, what, what endoscope would you advise for visualization of the hypo and the pro tympanum? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, as a matter of fact, what I normally do is I always start with a always start with the zero degree scope because the modern zero degree scope has got a very wide angle, and you will be able to see very nicely all the anatomy. But failing which, you can use a you know I know thirty degree scope is very underrated. The beauty is that it is actually a, in between zero and uh, forty five, and uh, for beginners especially, you can very easily get used to 30 degree scopes. So I would say the three scopes that I normally use is the 0, 30, and 45. 45 takes a little bit of practice to get used to, but um, if you can use a 45 degree, it's good, but if you can't, then I would use a 30 degree scope so that uh, you can see the anatomy well. Can I just request you for some of our junior uh, members who would have joined uh, into the talk. Um, would you mind just opening up the video that you had on the facial nerve anatomy and talking us through the relations of the facial nerve a little bit? Sure, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I've just cut the cord out there so that you can see the anatomy very well. So processes cochlear reforms is here, tensor tympani tendon, Facial nerve is actually just above, but it's got a very intricate relationship. There's a very tiny amount of bone between the facial nerve and the processes. And uh, you can see the, this is the area of the geniculate ganglion is going forwards. And this is the oval window 
and it's just above the um, facial is just above. So we're just opening up the the muscle itself. So I'll fast forward this a little bit. Okay, the muscle is there. Can you see the muscle being prodded? Mm -hmm. And you can see the tendon moving. And uh, like I said, don't try this home. And you know, you have to do it only in absolutely necessary situations. And you know, um, usually you know, it's not needed, but if you, if you need it, you know, anatomy will always help. So there we are. You can see okay, we'll fast forward this a little bit more. You can see that is a muscle being exposed. So you see a straight structure when you look at facial now, even beyond the tensor processes. That is actually the tensor tympanic muscle. It's not facial now, okay? Because just after the processes, the facial nerve actually goes medially here and uh, that becomes a geniculate ganglion. So can you see that is going that direction and this is going in this direction. And if you open, Absolutely. so you can see we are just opening up the, very gently opening up the, uh, the processes using a very fine instrument. Yeah. You can see the intricate relationship between the facial nerve and uh, the processes. Can you see? Okay, so that is the, the, the genicular ganglion is here and that's the greater petrosal nerve and the dura is here. The greater petrosal nerve is there, it is going towards the dura. So that is the tensor tympanic muscle out of its covering and the canal. So you can see the area of the uh, facial nerve and you can see this pink here is actually the dura. That's the dura and you see the dura is being exposed. So the facial nerve and the genicular ganglion has got a close relationship with the dura. Is that clear Ishan? Thank you. Thank you so much for repeating that. It's just for the uh, slightly more junior members who may have felt that things were a bit rushed. We've, we've all been a bit, uh, let's just say, short on time for everything. It's difficult to cover everything in... No, it's not only that, Ishan. The video was not playing like this. You know, it was, it is actually not, it's not playing its part. And now it is much better. So I'm happy that I'm able to show this because this is the most important sort of anatomical relationship that I want to show you. Thank you so much for showing that again. Do you want to show this video as well? You know, um, just... No, I think this video was quite clear. Okay, that's fine. Okay. So, if I come to the next question for you, that was, do you find the endoscopic technique appropriate for drainage of a petrous apex cholesterol granuloma? That's a very interesting question. I think petrous apex cholesterol granuloma will be very difficult to drain with anything. Okay, And... Uh, endoscope is no different. So we don't usually do it unless, if the patient has already got a dead ear and uh, if there is an abscess or something, then you may have to do it. It's a very rare procedure. Usually this responds to a cortical mastoidectomy and uh, uh, the drainage happens with that. So we sort of, we don't advise. The video that I showed, that is a case where patient already had a dead ear and a meningitis and CSF leak. So that is why I have to go through the, uh, the subcochlear canaliculus area, directly trans tympanic route to the petrous apex. Okay, sounds good. I think it's, uh, it's, it's one of those areas where we can, be, uh, we can end up doing a bit more than what we would want to be doing unless we are really experienced in the technique. Yes, yes. But this case was the, for me first as well because I, you know that in my hospital there's no neurosurgeon. So, but what happened on that day is it is summertime. All the skull base surgeons were on leave, and you know, either I operate or patient dies. So exactly. I was given the license to operate. You know, and uh, I was, I'm glad that you know I was able to do it only because of 
the, the knowledge of endoscopic anatomy and whatever we have done. And we do this every year at the cadavers. That's the beauty. So I would encourage everybody to attend a sort of, you know, a, a course, endoscopic ear course. Um, I'm not going to say that you must attend my course in Glasgow or Royal College course in Glasgow, but, you know, we have a very good course. But um, attend one of the good courses and get your hands on and practice before you embark on any sort of major stuff. You can do meringoplasty, you know, and uh, other things. I would say you can start practicing suction clearance in the clinic, then progress on to meringotomy and grommets with an endoscope and then raising the flap and in that order. Perfect. Um, the next question uh, was about, oh, do you feel there's any consideration of thermal injury using the endoscope? Beautiful question. Um, I'm glad that you asked this question. Uh, in my hands, no, because you know that we did a study uh, looking at the temperatures and the light intensity and uh, the image quality, which is published in clinical otolaryngology. The funny thing is that as surgeons, we, we are very macho, okay? We want to, so especially the, you know, uh, if somebody has been using like a gastroenterology surgeon or something, the, 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 the power is always put to 100%. But you don't need that for endoscopic ear surgery. I operate at 10%. So what our study showed that 10% image quality is as good as 100% and the temperatures are very low. The reason I did that study is because my hands were getting almost like a burning sensation after an hour of operating just by holding the scope. So you can imagine what is the temperature in the bottom. So um, if you use the very low lighting setting, that is very unlikely to have any damage. Don't use 100%. Start from 10% and gradually put the power up if necessary, you can go to 20%. And it also depends upon your um, scope, how good it is, and the cable. So we've done another study looking at the light and heat intensity on a, a sort of experimental um, study. And it shows that the image quality and the light is enough. And the temperatures are very low, actually. And the other thing is there's a misconception that LED light source is actually very good. But in our study, the LED light source was as bad as any. And you know, I, in fact, the, the tip of the cable, not tip of the scope, was 170 degrees. And you can actually burn through the, uh, the, the, you know, the drapes with that. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is, um, what are your thoughts on the role of the endoscope in a superior semicircular canal day since uh, repair? I do, it's a good question. I am, well, I don't have any personal experience uh, because we haven't seen that many, but the superior semicircular and dehiscence, if you are approaching um, transmastoid, there may not be enough space, but if, if somebody is approaching through the middle fossa, there's always a role for endoscopes. You can, you know, easily put an endoscope and have a look and uh, you can identify, put an expert in that. Perfect. And I think the last question that we've got in the chat is, uh, what's your open conversion rate for cholesteatoma recurrence post endoscopic surgery? Okay, very good question as well. I, we looked at our, my entire sort of learning curve and opening up ratio. When I started off, the chance of opening up the ear was, um, a, I think, 40, 60. 60% was opened up in the first two years. Then it became 60, 40. But in the last uh, few years, I'm only opening up the ear in 20% or less cases. And these cases are all been, we, my philosophy is these days to try endoscopic first. And then uh, we use powered instrumentation in the form of DCR bar or, you know, we had other instruments as well, uh, like Sonopet, but uh, it's been taken away because the hospital has not bought it yet. But we still have the DCR bar and uh, our sort of good curates. So I can remove cholestatoma almost up to the middle of the uh, lateral semicircular canal. But if it goes beyond, if, we, if, it is an, if it is very difficult, and if you are in doubt, don't be afraid to open up and uh, do a cortical mastoidectomy. But in my hands, the chance of opening up uh, in these patients are now becoming less than 20%. Brilliant. 
Thank you so much for the brilliant talk, Mr. Ayer. I think there was a lot of information in the time that we had. Um, I'm going to, going to try and make this available for everybody else to watch again uh, at some point. Uh, so please watch out on the AOT website for that. Um, thank you. It was really great having you. Look forward to your next talk uh, later on in November. Okay. So my advice, well, just one piece of advice. Um, even if you have a dry temporal bone lying somewhere, get an old scope and just have a look at it and, you know, through the middle ear and uh, you can identify the anatomical structures and, you know, you have nothing to lose. Okay. And if somebody is using an open operation, you can always get a scope and, you know, even attempt to examine it so that you will get grips with the, how to hold the endoscope and how to, you know, examine and how not to cause any damage. Maybe, okay. And then, learn the anatomy and that's the key and uh, hopefully I'll be able to shed more light on how to do the endoscopic air surgery uh, next time when we give the talk. Thank you Ishan for inviting me. Thank you so much Mr. Ayer. Thank you for the brilliant talk.